Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the fifth installment of the University of the Philippines, the Philippine Health Insurance Corporation's webinar series on Stop COVID Deaths. I'm Dr. Raymond Sarmiento from the National Telehealth Center of the National Institutes of Health of the University of the Philippines, Manila. It is always a pleasure uh, for us to be able to share the floor and this platform with all of you uh, during our regular Friday lunch date. And with me uh, is my co-host and my partner in crime, so to speak, my mentor, uh, Dr. Susie Pineda Mercado, who is also a board member of the Philippine Health Insurance Corporation. Dr. Susie? We'd like to welcome you to the fifth in a series of webinars for improving our knowledge and our understanding of clinical management of COVID. I know all of you who are listening out there are eager to hear our speaker. Uh, there's so much information that's changing so rapidly. So we thought that this this platform would be a good way to reach out to everybody. So, salamat po sa lahat ng sumama ngayon, sa lahat pong nanonood sa playback, at sana po marami kayong matutunan sa araw na ito. Raymond. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Susie. So, indeed, we have featured po, no? A renowned pulmonologist, infectious disease experts, uh, and also one of the top uh, renal specialists in the country. And for today, we have the head of the uh, adult infectious diseases section at San Lazaro Hospital. And before we go into an introduction of our uh, resource speaker, uh, I would like to call on Dr. Susie Mercado for an introduction po of our uh, speaker who will give our opening remarks. Dr. Okay. Susie? Before I, before I introduce our, um, our, our guest speaker and our <coughs> opening remarks speaker, I just wanted to say that, um, you know, Raymond, the rain is starting to come and people are getting worried about dengue and other infection. Okay, so I think I lost you for a moment. That's our new normal. We're, we're, uh, people are getting worried about new infections. So we're going to be talking about infections. But um, before, before we go into our main, our main speaker, it, it's my pleasure to introduce to you someone who's also been at the forefront of all of the response on COVID. And um, they've actually done an amazing job in terms of uh, getting the research agenda sorted out, and also helping expand the testing capability in the Philippines. So I'd like to welcome our um, opening remark speaker, who is the Executive Director of the National Institutes of Health, and she's also Vice Chancellor of Research for UP Manila. Let's welcome Dr. Eva Maria Cotionco de La Paz. Welcome, Eva. Hi, Eva. Good afternoon to you. Hello. That, that was a thunders that, that <laughs> just uh, stopped our uh, our webinar series but uh, thunder or no thunder good afternoon to all our attendees from the academe government and private sectors the national institutes of health university of the philippines is very honored to co-host this important webinar series with our partner the philippine health insurance corporation so every week we are privileged to have attendees join us in this weekly webinar from all over the Philippines as well as from abroad. I'd like to thank the teams who are making this weekly webinar series successful, namely the UP Office of the President represented by Executive Vice President, Dr. Teodoro Herbosa, Office of the Vice President for Public Affairs led by Dr. Elena Pernilla and also represented by AVP Rika Abad and Director Timi Cabana, TVUP led by Dr. Uh, Professor Gigi Alfonso, ITDC led by Director Paolo Paje, and from the National Institutes of Health, National Telehealth Center, its Director Dr. Raymond Sarmiento, and of course, Dr. Susie Pineda Mercado, the lead person on the Field Health Insurance Corporation. On this fifth session of the webinar series, we have one of the top infectious disease experts in the country who will talk about the impact of COVID on the control of dengue, tuberculosis, HIV, and other infections from the San Lazaro experience. Allow me to just briefly share some important contributions of the National Institutes of Health, UP Manila, during this time. 
the National Training Center for Biosafety and Biosecurity has been officially designated by the Department of Health as training provider for biosafety and biosecurity. NTCBB offers online biosafety education and awareness training called the BEAT COVID-19 program. This self-paced and student-directed training modules has now a total of 2,471 graduates. This certification program is an important component of the lab accreditation process of RITM. Together with UP Diliman's National Institute of Molecular Biology and Biotechnology, with Dr. Pia Bagamasbad as lead faculty, we are also offering hands-on training for SARS-CoV-2 testing. And we have trained 21 private and government institutions, not only from NCR, but also from uh, Eastern Visayas, Tacloban, and Ilocos. These institutions have now set up their own molecular labs, and some are still in the process of having their lab accredited. Special thanks to Dr. Susie Pineda Mercado, who was the driving force to create such a program to assist laboratories. And lastly, uh, the NIH COVID-19 Testing Laboratory has to date provided testing for 8,331 patients from PGH, a COVID referral center, and 29 other hospitals and community quarantine areas in the cities of Manila, Mandaluyong, Makati, San Juan, as well as Cavite, free of charge, surviving on donations from UP, PGH, DOH, RITM, as well as generous donors from the private sector. The National Institutes of Health values the importance and transformative role of research in informing national policies and supports the University of the Philippines and the Philippine Health Insurance Corporation in disseminating the state of the art in terms of clinical management of COVID-19 cases. May this webinar series, such as what we have today, contribute to our knowledge on diagnosis, management, and prevention measures, and allow us also to find sustainable solutions to fight COVID together. Maraming salamat po at magandang hapon po sa inyong lahat. Thank you so much, uh, Executive Director Eva Cotronco de La Paz, who is my boss over at the National Institutes of Health. It really is a huge body of work that the NIH has been doing. And it's really inspiring for all of us, not just at UP Manila, but for everyone who is at the forefront of fighting the COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you, uh, Dr. Eva, for that inspiring uh, speech. And then before we go to an introduction of our uh, research speaker for today, uh, I would like to uh, enjoin our attendees. Uh, right in front of your screens po would be our uh, pre-test questions, although it might show post-webinar questions right now. These are actually pre-test questions, and then after the webinar, we will be uh, answering them. Actually, our research speaker will be providing po the correct answers for these questions. So, uh, the first question, it, uh, it reads, simultaneous testing for both uh, pulmonary tuberculosis and COVID-19 will be indicated for three main reasons, except option A, simultaneous exposure to both diseases, option B, presence of a risk factor for poor outcomes to either pulmonary tuberculosis or COVID-19, Option C, clinical manifestations are common to both diseases. And option D, previous history of BCG vaccine and pulmonary calcification. So the answers are slowly trickling in. Currently, we have uh, on, on this Zoom uh, webinar uh, 144 attendees uh, uh, to date. Uh, but we also have other um, attendees joining us. Uh, in YouTube and in, uh, in other uh, means. So at least, so nearly half of the at attendees answered po, no? Uh, for question number one, previous history of BCG vaccine and pulmonary calcification. We will ask our research speaker kung ano po ang tamang kasagutan dito po sa question number one. And then for question number two, it reads, the following are the precautionary measures that people living with HIV should adhere to prevent the spread of COVID-19 infection, except option A, avoid close contact with anyone who has fever or cough, 
Option B, clean hands frequently with alcohol gel. Option C, cover your mouth and nose with a tissue when coughing or sneezing. And option D, if feeling ill, wear a surgical mask and practice self-isolation. So again, nearly half of our attendees chose option B, naman po, na clean hands frequently with alcohol gel. Uh, so just just put in po your answers and towards the end of, uh, of this webinar, we will ask our resource speaker to provide the correct answers. And uh, I will turn over the mic over to my partner and co-host, Dr. Susie Pineda Marcado, for the introduction of our resource speaker for today. Dr. Susie? Thank you very much, Raymond. Parang mahirap yata yung mga tanong, no? Anyway, I hope you're <laughs> this because we, we just really wanted to have a sense of, you know, trying to get the audience to say, what are the things I took away or what, I learned, what did I learn from? From the webinar. So I hope you enjoy the little poll questions we have. Anyway, um, as you know, there are more than 12,000 cases reported of um, COVID-19, possibly more as our testing capability increases. Over 800 deaths have been reported. But at the same time, as I mentioned earlier, we know that the rains are coming. Last year, we had 400,000 cases of dengue, about 1,500 deaths. Tuberculosis kills 70 people every day and we have one of the highest increases uh, rates of increase in the world for HIV AIDS. So now when you bring all of that together with COVID-19, um, what are we going to do? How do we handle this situation? And what do we do if we're looking at possible infections uh, of, from multiple microbes, etc.? Of course, uh, best, to get, uh, best to get information from an expert in infectious disease. And um, what we're seeing and learning from the San Lazaro Hospital, I think is something that's uh, worth, uh, worth learning uh, across, across all hospitals, across all, um, across all uh, clinical facilities, and for practitioners, doctors, nurses, medical technologists, and so on. So it's my pleasure to uh, welcome today our, our guest speaker. He's the head of the Adult Infectious Disease Unit of the San Lazaro Hospital. Uh, we'd like to welcome Dr. Jean Solante to our webinar. Welcome, Jean. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Susi again for inviting me and to share our experience here in San Lazaro Hospital. And that it's true, it's really challenging. If you are in a hospital that caters uh, most of these uh, common infectious diseases, so this is the scope of my discussion. We'll go through the current situation now here in San Lazaro Hospital. And uh, we'll also give you an update on how are we doing with our patients with COVID, especially with the use of these uh, inter inter investigational drugs. Okay? But the um, main focus here is we'll fo uh, be on the other co-infections that we do encounter among our COVID patients, particularly those with HIV and those with uh, tuberculosis. And the last part will be about the healthcare worker since we also do a regular surveillance or testing among our healthcare workers so, uh, uh, in this hospital, uh, in this hospital for us to know uh, who are really carriers or who are infected. So San Lazaro Hospital is a 500 bed capacity and infectious disease referral hospital. And it's also one of the 31 national or sub-national refer referral laboratory for COVID-19. And we have two accredited training programs by uh, the, the adult infectious disease and then the uh, family and community uh, medicine. In terms of uh, programs of the Department of Health, we are one of the HIV confirmatory referral laboratory, the SACCL. And then we also have here our HIV treatment hub, the DOTS referral hospital, and the uh, multi-drug resistant tuberculosis uh, referral. So you look at this particular facility, everything is here from drug susceptible to drug uh, resistant uh, uh, common um, uh, infectious uh, disease. So we are also the first hospitals who diagnosed the first two cases of COVID cases in the Philippines last January 23. And currently we are one of those uh, centers participating in the WHO solidarity trial. Okay, so I'll start first with the uh, cases here in San Lazaro Hospital. This is a data from January to May. And if you'll notice, the number one uh, infectious disease uh, admission that we have is still dengue. 
and then this is followed by tetanus, then you have community-acquired pneumonia, you have snake bite, rabies, tuberculosis, varicella, including those patients with uh, opportunistic infections, CNS infection, and the other. But uh, this data compares with the previous uh, months is uh, really very low. And I think the majority here can be explained because uh, we focus on the uh, management of uh, uh, COVID. And that's why comparing it with our number of cases admitted because of COVID, we have a total of 240 since May. And this is the uh, breakdown of the uh, cases. Then uh, what are the most common symptoms among these patients? So this is quite challenging for us because uh, anybody who comes in with fever, we have to do screening and test them for COVID, whether they, uh, as long as they are not, uh, we have to look into the risk of exposure, the history and the findings of uh, lower respiratory tract infections, then we can focus on COVID, but still we have to rule out tuberculosis, we have to rule out uh, other uh, pneumonia that can also be present since uh, we do encounter a lot of these patients prior to COVID-19. But focusing on COVID, since uh, January, we now have a total of uh, uh, 88 cases uh, confirmed among those uh, patients that were tested. And this is our data in terms of the mortality. Now, uh, this is also the same as what we are reporting now in the country that the male is the most common or the common sex that is uh, uh, confirmed with a higher risk of uh, death. In this uh, the, uh, group of patients, the most common cause of death is usually 50-50. Either they die of severe sepsis or they die of the severe pulmonary complications in the form of the acute respiratory disease syndrome. But uh, look at our data here. Among the 19 mortalities that we have, more than 68% uh, of these are the age group of 50 years old and above. And this can only tell you how high is the risk for mortality based on age because of what we call age-dependent defect in T cell and B cell function. And uh, in, in, in this uh, case, uh, we need to really prioritize uh, close monitoring and early intervention among this group. But this is not also to say that we, cannot, we should forget also those patients with HIV and those with concomitant uh, uh, immunocompromised status, especially those patients with uh, tuberculosis. Uh, our data is a bit uh, uh, better in terms of the confirmed death in the country because in the DOH uh, situationer, 86% of those who died because of COVID or confirmed death are 50 years old and above. So again, this is something to do with the elderly, the age as an important and major risk factor for determinant of uh, survival. Now, among the cases that were uh, document that we documented and who died, then uh, majority of those also had comorbidities. But if you look at some of these comorbidities, it may not be typical comorbidities that you have encountered in some of the data. Like, yes, uh, hypertension is one of those, the most common, then we have diabetes mellitus, but we also have here, those patients who died of TB, those patients who died of HIV, concomitant COVID, and those patients who died because of the presence of HIV, and the presence of uh, tuberculosis, the double infection. So I mean, they have three infections, COVID, HIV, and pulmonary tuberculosis. And this really is very challenging for us as clinicians on how to go about in this uh, group of patients. And this is just the data coming from China that the, the presence of uh, an underlying medical conditions, which did not also uh, mention about the significance of other infection diseases as a comorbidity and contributor of mortality like HIV, and uh, tuberculosis. Uh, this is a snapshot of the other uh, presence of co-infections among our patients. Okay? And one of the most common uh, co-infections that we encountered among those select group of those mortality are patients with uh, COVID at the same time with uh, seasonal influenza B. And then you also have here Streptococcus pneumoniae. Uh, one of the patients died because of a concomitant uh, Streptococcus pneumoniae. And then you have Enterococcus fecalis, Staphylococcus ominis bacteremia. So, so to say, these are the uh, secondary infection that during the course of treatment, probably these are also hospital acquired that uh, at risk or higher risk also of uh, mortality. If we look at some of the significant laboratories that uh, are found in most, most of our patients, 
this is in, in, in relation to how good is the immune response in patients with a natural infection. Usually we do have what we call elevation of the WBC. But in most patients that we encounter, particularly those associated with higher mortality, most of the WBC here is really normal. And in fact, the mean uh, uh, value is uh, 8,000, and uh, most of them also have decreased uh, lymphocytes, even with the presence of a superimposed bacterial infection. So meaning there is a dominance here of the COVID-19 over that of the other bacterial co-infections, because if you look at data for COVID-19 patients only, most of those really had lymphopenia and leukopenia. And in fact, if you review the diagnostic testings and the different typical abnormalities, aside from the elevation of the different inflammatory markers that is very characteristic, particularly for those patients with a cytokine storm. Now, the most important part here is that most of those has leukopenia and relative lymphopenia. So the implication here is that COVID-19 is really causing this immunosuppression plus the fact that you have a patient that is elderly, you have a patient with concomitant tuberculosis or concomitant HIV, then that really brings down the immune response. And then it is also related with higher rate of mortality. And that is now what we are experiencing in our uh, patient. This is uh, data coming from the, our, uh, our list of mortality. And if you look at the radiologic characteristics, this is the, 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 commonly, the common radiographic findings that is suggestive of uh, positive patients with uh, COVID. Consolidation is still the most common, followed by uh, uh, ground glass uh, opacity. So this is chest X-ray. This is a chest CT scan. Okay? And the distribution is uh, more or less bilateral in involvement. If you look at our data, most of those patients who died, in fact, 90% of those had bilateral pneumonia, and only two of these had lower pneumonia. And so this means that uh, the majority of those who died of uh, COVID really has what we call significant involvement of the uh, pulmonary organ. And that's the reason why most of them end up with complication of hypoxemia and acute respiratory distress uh, syndrome. Now, we're looking at how can we utilize uh, chest X-ray in terms of uh, predicting severity or even uh, making it as a tool to... Uh, uh, assess improvement. So uh, we have here, we're using this uh, severity scoring system in COVID-19, and this entails the uh, assignment of percentage of each of the lungs to percentage, and the higher the number of lung involvement, the higher also is the percentage here. So here, if there is more than 75% involvement, then this is also related with a higher uh, risk of mortality. And somehow we observe that in, uh, in some of our patients. I'll give you one example, okay? Remember, this is a, not a 50-year-old individual. This is a 39-year-old male. And uh, this patient is also infected with uh, uh, HIV, okay? So if you look at the chest X-ray upon uh, admission and then comparing it from day 12 to day 15 to day 17, okay? So this is the time that the patient uh, became uh, uh, toxic, progressive uh, uh, dyspnea, and uh, we tried to do the scoring. Okay, so you have involvement here of uh, two lobes, and you have 50%. Okay, and then on day 15 there was uh, the need for uh, intubation. So this patient's uh, uh, respiratory uh, status became. Uh, uh, progressive and to the point that uh, when we repeated the, the chest x-ray, it's now more than 75% uh, involvement. And we know that at this point in time, the mortality is really very high. And then it's just a matter of time. On day 17, two days after, we saw this particular pattern, which we call ARDS. Okay, So progressive increase in the bilateral infiltrates up to the day of uh, demise. And this patient was uh, RT-PCR positive uh, even until the ninth day of uh, illness. So you just can imagine the viremia occurring in this particular patient and then uh, before the patient died on the 17th uh, uh, day. The other end of the uh, uh, radiographic uh, uh, findings here, this is a 53-year-old male, uh, confirmed uh, COVID, okay, and uh, First, the time that the first detected on the tenth day of illness, okay, and I think this is also in relation that viremia is usually 
very high after or during the first week or later part of the or early part of the second week. So this is consistent with this particular patient. So uh, again, there was 75% uh, involvement of the lungs. And then significantly when the RT-PCR uh, RT was detected, uh, undetected on the 15th day, prior to the, unde the undetected uh, result, you notice there is also improvement in the uh, chest X-ray. So the value here of correlation of your RT-PCR with that of the chest X-ray can also be another uh, uh, a tool for us to develop and uh, use uh, in the assessment of the prognosis among these patients. So more or less, uh, we do regular RT-PCR every two to three days among our critically ill patients. And we also correlate it with the clinical manifestations, meaning even if they have symptoms, but they are uh, progressively deteriorating, we do repeat the PCR until such time it is negative. And we found out that most of those who had a higher rate of mortality, the RT-PCR positivity is really uh, continues to be positive until uh, their uh, demise. So the other tool that we've been using here in our hospital is also the chest CT. And uh, for us, uh, this is uh, more or less, it uh, somehow supplement the findings in the chest X-ray. There are three patterns of uh, findings in the chest CT that you need to look at, okay? Uh, very characteristic is the ground glass uh, opacity. Okay? And ground glass opacity is not only uh, specific for COVID. In fact, patients with tuberculosis, patients with uh, pneumocystis gerovacin uh, pneumonia, which is also seen in most of our patients, also have ground glass uh, opacities. And this is where the, the, uh, uh, the challenge for us clinicians, because if you see that ground glass uh, opacity and your patient, you suspect patient is, has TB, you suspect that the patient is HIV with opportunistic infection, the only way to really diagnose them is the use of an RT-PCR, the patient is COVID positive. The second uh, most common uh, uh, findings in a chest CT find, uh, in, uh, in patients with COVID is the crazy paving pattern ground glass pacification with interlobular septal thickening with intralobular lines. And this, it, this appears like this, okay? And then the last one is uh, consolidation. So meaning it doesn't always mean that the absence of uh, uh, ground glass op uh, opacity, uh, you will be able to rule out uh, COVID-19. Consolidation is common among those patients with bacterial pneumonia, but we have seen a lot of our COVID-19, even without co-infection with bacterial pneumonia, they also have pure consolidation on chest uh, CT. Okay, so in terms of the chest CT findings in our hospital, uh, you'll notice that uh, the most common is still the ground glass opacity. And then you also have a combination of a ground glass opacity and uh, consolidation in this uh, group of uh, uh, patients. But uh, there are also patients in which the chest CT findings may not be uh, 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 what we call this diagnostics. That's why you, you cannot use chest CT findings as a uh, uh, confirming the presence of your uh, COVID-19. And I'm saying that because there are some of those who ask us that uh, in the absence of an RT-PCR and the patient has symptoms, can we diagnose them without an RT-PCR and just looking at the chest uh, CT findings? No, you should also do your RT-PCR. Now I'll go to the interventions using investigational uh, drugs. Okay, so we use the uh, management algorithm that is being uh, recommended by the Philippine Society for Microbiology and Infection Diseases. And if you go through this uh, algorithm, it starts with the symptom-based uh, screening and then the presence of comorbidities and age. So if these are present, if you have less than 60 years old or more than, uh, more than 60 years old and the presence of comorbid conditions, then you directly will consider this patient as having moderate risk uh, uh, pneumonia. And then if they have... Uh, hemodynamic alteration with progressive uh, uh, hypoxemia, then you will categorize them as se having severe or high risk, okay? And these are the two patients, group of patients that we always have to, to admit, okay? And uh, once admitted, we uh, either give them the, uh, any of these investigational drugs, either in the form of chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine, if they are eligible, meaning if they don't have any contraindications like uh, cardiac abnormality or uh, QT interval uh, prolongation. And then we also consider giving a combination 
using either lupinavir, ritunavir, which is an HIV uh, drug. Okay? So uh, this, this, this is where we all, uh, is also another challenge because if you're giving an, an LPV, ritunavir, in a patient that you will not screen as having HIV, then chances are you will be uh, also promoting drug resistance. So that's the reason why that uh, when we have patients uh, with COVID, we always ask, are there risk factors for HIV? Okay, multiple sex partners, or are they, or have they been diagnosed with HIV in the past? And then once they are in severe respiratory distress or the beginning of the cytokine-related syndrome, then uh, one drug that we consider very important also is the uh, monoclonal antibody drug or anti-inflammatory drug in the form of tocilizumab. So. This is a slide that will tell us the different potential drug targets of the different uh, 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 investigational drugs, okay? Either in the form of inhibiting the replication of the virus, and this is where remdesivir and lupinavir, ritunavir will act, and then inhibit viral entry. This is where chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine will be an important uh, uh, drug. And then prevention of activation of the inflammatory molecules and this is where your tocilizumab will also act. So this is how we should be doing this and understand why are we giving a combination or single drug or two drugs and what is the, the effect of this uh, uh, intervention and looking at it, since these are all investigational drugs, then it has to be used in the context of a clinical trial. And that's what we're doing here in uh, San Lazaro Hospital. So currently as part of the solidarity clinical uh, trial, uh, out of the 24, we're one of those hospitals. We are also uh, randomizing our uh, patients either to receive remdesivir or lupinavir, ritunavir, or a combination of your lupinavir, ritunavir with interferon beta 1 alpha, and or those will be randomized alone using your chloroquine and hydroxy uh, uh, chloroquine. Okay, so when we reviewed our mortality and the interventions that were given, Okay, so majority of those that uh, patients uh, we admit, especially those with severe and moderate severe uh, COVID, we always uh, start with antibiotic before the, the result of the COVID-19 test result will come in because uh, uh, that's part of uh, the guideline that anybody who is critically ill and will present with more severe type of pneumonia, you also have to give antibiotic at the onset. Now, the other spectrum of these uh, in interventions we gave, uh, there was one patient, we also gave oseltamivir uh, since this patient was positive for influenza B, okay? And then patients with, uh, with, some of them were given hydroxychloroquine and then four patients received lupinavir, ritunavir, and then combination, three patients with really critical uh, uh, clinical manifestations. We combined the, the chloroquine, and with that of the lupinavir, ritunavir, and then, of course, most of those uh, that had severe or ARDS are on mechanical ventilation. And while those that did not require mechanical ventilation was able to tolerate oxygen via uh, face mask, okay? And uh, these are the uh, interventions that we've uh, been giving lately, since uh, tocilizumab is also already available in the hospital after our uh, uh, approval by the FDA and by the Department of Health. So if you look at some of the combined uh, interventions here, aside from antibiotic, we do give chloroquine, lopinavir, and including that of uh, tocilizumab. So it's part of the standard of care, depending on the severity and depending also if they have contraindications of those drugs, okay? But what I would like to share with you here, our experience with the use of tocilizumab among patients with uh, COVID-19, and in fact, uh, we have a very good uh, uh, experience with tocilizumab among those uh, patients who survive. Okay? Although this is still a very small data, but we continue to observe how good these drugs are since they are investigational. Uh, hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine, you'll notice in this uh, slide, uh, these are the uh, survivors, and then the blue one is the uh, survivors and the the red one is the non-survivor, meaning there is really a, uh, not so significant, but the trend here is that given uh, among those who survive, you have higher patients that uh, were given the uh, investigational drugs, okay? Uh, 
sharing with you some of the cases that we put on the, the anti-inflammatory drug uh, tocilizumab. So this is a 40-year-old male, a confirmed severe case, okay, who also has diabetes. Okay, and uh, this is the sixth day uh, of illness before tocilizumab was uh, given. Uh, if you notice that the, the chest x-ray may not be that bad, but if you look at the clinical presentation of the patient, the patient begins to be in the storm uh, clinical manifestations. The inflammatory markers were already elevated and the oxygen requirement, which is the most important initial uh, findings among those with cytokine storm. If you have a patient with increasing oxygen requirement uh, in a few days or in a few hours, then that's the start of the storm. We gave tocilizumab, and then this is two days uh, after tocilizumab. You'll notice that uh, there was not significant clearing, but there was uh, uh, really, uh, what we call, an improvement in the clinical status and a slight improvement also in the radiologic appearance uh, after the use of the anti-inflammatory drug. And another uh, same patient, when we did the chest CT, okay, because one of our protocol here, part of the protocol is that if you're give, giving tocilizumab, you also need to monitor the chest CT findings. So this is the uh, chest CT of a patient uh, after four days receiving the tocilizumab. Okay? So meaning uh, you'll notice that there is a really decrease in the ground glass appearance of the, uh, uh, in the chest CT. Okay? And the consolidation has also uh, decreased. And then another patient, this is uh, again a 37 year old male and with some of the comorbidities that I have mentioned. And the, this is the uh, chronology of the improvement. This is before the tocilizumab. And then after the tocilizumab, you'll notice that comparing this one, this is before tocilizumab, 13th day, this is seventh day after tocilizumab, you'll notice that this part here of the lungs, Okay, bilateral uh, consolidation and ground glass appearance more or less has decreased, significantly decreased. And this is also associated with uh, 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 improvement in the clinical uh, status of the patient. Okay? So this is just some of the success story that we have among our patients who are uh, critically ill. Now, what are the other co-infections that we have encountered? Since I have mentioned uh, Streptococcus pneumoniae, influenza B. One of the mo other important uh, co-infections that we have been among, uh, uh, we have experienced among our patients are those patients with mycobacterium tuberculosis and uh, uh, HIV, okay? So if you look at some of these articles that were based on those patients uh, infected with uh, SARS-CoV-1 in the past, okay? This is the interrelationship between the virus, the host, and uh, the bacterial infections, which will be a determinant of the severity and eventually outcome. So you have here some of the, uh, the changes or the pathology. You have more inflammation. You have increase in the number of the viral load of the virus. At the same time, when you have increased viral load, there is also higher opportunity for this microorganism to stimulate your macrophage and produce more uh, chemokines, your interferon, which are the determinant of your cytokine storm. And then once you have cytokine storm, there is also increase in apoptosis, okay? So increased cell stress, cell death, and necrosis. And at the same time, at the level of the alveolar uh, uh, cells, you have here, uh, increase in hypoxia. So it's no wonder that if you have a patient with multiple infections with COVID-19, you also expect a higher rate uh, of uh, mortality. Okay? Uh, just to share with you, the, this is the first COVID-19 infection in the Philippines that was uh, documented here in, in, in San Lazaro Hospital. Uh, this patient doesn't have any comorbidities. He's a 44-year-old male, a Chinese uh, uh, tourists who visited the Philippines who developed fever, cough, and chills. Now, when we did examine the, uh, the respiratory tract uh, specimen, aside from being COVID positive, this patient also has influenza B and at the same time streptococcus pneumoniae. So remember, again, this patient doesn't have any comorbidities. So 
does these two infection contributed to the demise of this patient? That remains to be uh, a, a question that we don't know. But if you look at the, the rationality there, when you have uh, bacterial co-infections in the setting of a patient with COVID-19, then most likely the presence of other or two other infections can also increase the risk of poor outcome. Now, this is something that the first time we did uh, have a patient with COVID-19 and at the same time TB. So this is a 54-year-old male who presented with sudden onset of fever for 14 days. Okay? And this was uh, accompanied by uh, difficulty of breathing and body weakness. Okay? And remember this patient uh, developed uh, PTB treatment for eight months in 2018. Okay, so when we admitted this patient, this is the chest X-ray, and it looks like that uh, we really suspect that this is purely tuberculosis. Okay, but when we look at the area here, it seems that this this uh, infiltrate is new. So uh, this patient initially consulted in the in the uh, outpatient, but when this patient was found to be positive the patient was advised admission, okay? And from this day up to this uh, date, uh, uh, an interval of eight days, look at the infiltrate here. It's really progressive, okay? But if you are, a patient, if you are uh, looking at this area here, you will say, this is TB, but would I suspect also COVID in this patient with tuberculosis? It's a tough question, okay? But you go to the history. This patient was asymptomatic for how many months and only had complaint of fever for 14 days. So this is an acute onset manifestation. And probably this can be the result of his previous TB treatment or previous TB uh, infection. So you have here a destroyed lung. So this is new one. Unfortunately, this patient was also positive for TB. So that's why we, we, we labeled him as TB relapse. And at the same time, eventually this patient turned out to be COVID-19 positive. So in that perspective, what is the difference and how do we approach a patient with TB and at the same time with COVID-19? In terms of mortality rate, of course, your PTB has a higher risk of mortality. And especially if TB occurs in those who are uh, untreated or those who are immunocompromised. But the risk factor for both of these are more or less the same. They can be elderly, they can have comorbidities, okay? they can have immunocompromised, and more or less the same as that with the TB risk factor. So meaning, if you highly suspect that these are risk factors present in your patient, it's difficult to rule out one over the other. And it's really better to also get specimen and test not only for COVID-19, but also test them for PT using your gene expert, not using your smear. It's always your gene expert. Those patients with co-infection with COVID-19 and TB, both of them can exacerbate the natural symptoms of the other. So going back to our patient, okay, this patient has had TB in 2018. It could be possible that the presence of your COVID-19 has activated a new onset of tuberculosis, or it could also be a possibility that that patient already has a multidrug resistant TB since this patient has been exposed to uh, previous medication. And that will really have a negative impact on a person's health, meaning risk of mortality is really very high. So what is the risk of TB? Uh, TB and risk of getting infected with COVID-19. Currently, there's no data according to the union uh, among those TB and co uh, COVID-19, but uh, they surmise that uh, if you have both of these, then the outcome is, uh, could be or should be worse. Okay? And TB disease may put patients at increased risk also of developing more severe COVID-19 symptoms. So that's also been observed in one of our patients. Patients with TB lung diseases should consider limiting their exposure to high risk in environment. This is what we always uh, emphasize among our patients with TB since we, are, we also have DOTS and MDR TB. As much as possible, the, the prevention that we use uh, for those patients with COVID-19 should also apply among them. But the more important part here is you always have to see to it that you also not be doing something to really decrease the immune function of your lungs. And one of that is stop using tobacco or any tobacco products like vaping. So for the TB program or the DOTS provider, this is one of the uh, recommendations, okay? Never discontinue the drug. The, the TB program should always provide 
the drug to their patients during this lockdown. So there's no, there's no lockdown in terms of TB dust provision of medication. Procurement and supply management system should always be in place so that there will be no interruption in the treatment of TB because once this patient will uh, develop uh, uh, resurgence of TB, then that puts them, again, a higher risk of getting COVID-19. There were models that were uh, uh, exemplified here that will involve the, uh, the, the, the social distancing, okay? One is self-administered therapy. So meaning, meaning uh, the patient can uh, take his medications while not going to the DOTS uh, facility, but the DOTS facility should also follow up every day by calling through uh, a mobile phone and then checking on if the patient is taking the medication regularly. The other evidence here that the patient should be taking the anti-TB medication is a video observed therapy. So this is very important in terms of in, instead of going to the clinic, a higher risk of exposure, then they will be staying in the in the in the in their house in their home, and then they will just have to uh, take the video. They're they're taking the medication. Okay. Now, in those areas where there is a lockdown, the local government should also prioritize uh, that they should be given the medication. So some of the uh, strategies now are some of these healthcare workers are going to this area and. Uh, distributing the medication if the patient is in a community where there is uh, an ongoing uh, lockdown. Okay, so so to say, TB programs should have a system in place to continue to support people on uh, TB treatment. Okay, so this is just a comparison of uh, TB and uh, COVID-19, more or less uh, how this uh, two um, infection compares in terms of infectiousness, prevention, and treatment. Okay. So for TB, there is treatment, but for COVID-19, there's only supportive treatment, okay? So if there is drugs that, if there are drugs that we're giving now, these are all investigational. The next uh, challenging case, this is a COVID-19 and HIV positive, okay? So this is 35 year old uh, from this uh, area who complains again of fever. This patient was diagnosed with HIV since 2015, okay? So, See, the patient was on antiretroviral treatment, but he stopped, he stopped in 2018 and was lost to follow up. Okay? So again, he manifested with the following manifestations. And upon examination, these were our findings. Okay? So his, this patient is really in cardiorespiratory distress. So if you look at the chest x-ray, it may seem to be, to be normal. But if you look at the, the detail here, there is really an interstitial uh, 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 infiltrates, okay, and the patient is uh, hypotensive, tachycardic, and tachypnic. Since we have an idea here that this patient is HIV positive since 2015 and presented with fever, what usually will you think of this patient? Will you think of COVID or will you think of an opportunistic infection? Okay, of course, we, we always prioritize if this is COVID because we are now in the, we have a community transmission. But at the outset, we also have to rule out if this patient also has pneumocystis gerovacin pneumonia because the radiologic appearance of PCP and that of your COVID-19 can also be the same, being interstitial and bilateral. And at the same time, this patient is also hypoxemic, hypotensive, and tachypneic. Okay, so we treated the patient as having PCP severe. The same time when we did the examination, the patient also have oral candidiasis. So meaning the CD4 count of this patient is really very low because he stopped the medication of his ARV in 2018. So the implication here is that if you're an HIV and you continue your ARV, that in itself is the protection that you, your risk of acquiring COVID will be the same as that with the general population, very low. So that's why. But if you are an HIV positive and you will stop your antiretroviral medication, then that's very dangerous because that will also increase your risk of uh, getting COVID because you will be immunocompromised. Based on several of the study, the clinical characteristic of COVID-19 in patients with HIV appear to be similar to those without HIV. So meaning you have the cough, you have the fever, you have the difficulty of breathing. So meaning it's difficult to rule out one over the other. Now, among those HIV, if they are on effective antiretroviral treatment, meaning they have a very good viral load count, undetectable, and their CD4 count is very high, then that again, decreases the risk that they will get coronavirus. So meaning 
when you have patients, you suspect HIV, you always have to get the CD4 count. You always have to get the viral load count when, they, when you suspect that they have COVID-19 because these are the parameters that will also help you prognosticate because the lower the viral, the higher the viral load count, the lower the CD4 count in the presence of an opportunistic infection, in the presence of your COVID-19, then the risk is very high. So prevention is always important among this population. So aside from the usual precautionary measures like hand hygiene, face mask, and physical distancing, the current uh, uh, management prevention now is also to give them the pneumococcal and influenza vaccine. Okay? So I think this is not only with HIV, but also for our elderly uh, patients. Since we are also now uh, entering in the influenza season, this is where you need to maximize the giving of your vaccine despite this uh, uh, pandemic. What about those clinicians who will be managing patients with HIV and at the same time with COVID-19? Okay, number one, ART should not be discontinued. You have to continue the antiretroviral therapy. Look at some of the drug-drug interactions. If you're giving what we call investigational drugs, you have to look at what are the drug interactions among this uh, individual when they will be receiving the antiretroviral therapy. Okay, and then at the same time, uh, uh, clinicians should ask providers to waive drug supply quantity restrictions. So meaning, as long as the patient is, uh, the, the patient should have access to this uh, uh, antiretroviral uh, treatment. If they will be in another, admitted in, a, in another center, not in the treatment hub that they used to have this follow-up, then they have to communicate with a treatment hub that can give them the antiretroviral therapy so that it will not be uh, discontinued. Okay, so avoid drug substitutions or ARV drug substitutions as much as possible. Procure the ARV that the patient is uh, currently being given. And then clinician must assess potential for drug interactions if they, are been, if, they are, uh, if they are receiving investigational drugs. And of course, social distancing and isolation uh, may exacerbate mental health and issues for some persons with HIV. So we have some patients with uh, newly diagnosed HIV may have some issues with uh, mental health, and then that should also be uh, closely followed up and closely monitored by the uh, clinicians who are in the treatment hub, okay? The third case that I would like to show here is the triple infection. We have a COVID-19 confirmed, HIV positive, and you also have tuberculosis, okay? Very challenging case, but eventually this patient, I think this patient did not make it, okay? So this is the chest X-ray when this patient was uh, initiated on antiretroviral treatment, whose baseline CD4 count was 87 during the time, January 16, okay? And at the same time, it is also at this period that the intensive phase of treatment was uh, uh, initiated with TB treatment, okay? And the patient presented with decrease in sensorium for the past two weeks. There was progressive fever, body malay, decrease in appetite, cough and uh, productive, diagnosed with HIV to, uh, 2019, and newly diagnosed with PTB in November 2019. Okay, so there are a lot of dilemma here. This is a confirmed case of HIV. He only started with this, with his uh, ART in January, so meaning fourth month, you don't expect this patient's immune system will improve, and that's another risk for acquiring COVID-19. So. This patient uh, had a very low WBC count and look at the lymphocyte count, it's only three. So this is severe uh, lymphopenia, okay? So these are the uh, patients that uh, are higher risk of mortality. Another patient with a triple infection, uh, 27 year old, again, complaining of fever and uh, diagnosed, newly diagnosed with HIV in January, 2020 came in because of uh, severe uh, 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 dry cough and uh, high fever, uh, diagnosed with both with TB and HIV in January, and the patient came in because of hypotension and increase in the uh, temperature, okay? The oxygen saturation is 95% at room air, and look at the CD4 count of this patient, it's only four. So chances are you will really get COVID while you are still starting your treatment on ARV. But unfortunately, okay, this patient has not been started on antiretroviral therapy. Why? Because he was diagnosed with HIV in January 2020. 
the lockdown was smart. He was not able to follow up with the treatment huh, because of the fear that uh, he, can, uh, he will acquire COVID-19. And that fear became a reality. And that's why he was admitted because of severe COVID and severe tuberculosis. Okay, this is the last part. Uh, healthcare workers, we always value our frontliners in terms of their, ser of their service, in terms of taking care of COVID-19, but they're also the most at risk in acquiring the infection. So we also do what we call regular surveillance among our healthcare workers every three weeks, okay? The first wave of the healthcare workers, we were able to test 196 of them, and seven became positive. If you look at the rundown of those infected, one was a doctor, three were nurses, and three were laboratory personnel. Okay, what are the common comorbidities among these healthcare workers who were positive for COVID? Okay, majority of them had obesity, hypertension, or a mix of your diabetes, and asthma. And these are the most uh, common symptoms. You have cough, sore throat, rhinorrhea, loss of smell, loss of taste, headache, myalgia, and fatigue. So you'll notice most of this patient doesn't have fever, okay? So again, the, 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 the bottom line here doesn't need that you have to have fever. If you have all of these symptoms in your healthcare worker, especially malay, myalgia, fatigue, or even a headache, then uh, chances are that you need to, to investigate, uh, need to investigate and uh, do some uh, history taking if there was really breach of the use of PPE or exposure in the community, then you have to, to, to screen them for COVID-19. Uh, this is the Department of Health uh, tracker on healthcare workers with confirmed COVID-19. And you'll notice that uh, the peak of the uh, healthcare workers getting infected was between March and April, and it has gone down since May. Okay? And I would like to share with you here some of the risks how does a healthcare worker acquire this uh, COVID-19 in the performance of their duties, okay? One of that that was been identified is the lack of PPEs for physicians when interacting with patients positive for COVID-19. Second is performance of a high-risk procedures such as tracheal intubation, tracheostomy, laryngoscope, or other airway procedures. That's why you have to be very careful when you are doing aerosol generating procedures in most of your uh, patients. Although wearing PPE is a protection, but it will not guarantee also that it is 100% uh, percent that will protect you. Now, existing comorbidities, including that of fatigue, are also factors that can be in play uh, that increases the risk of us healthcare workers to, to get uh, COVID, okay? So in summary, uh, COVID-19 cases remain the bulk of our admitted cases here in San Lazaro Hospital with clinical features, comorbidities, and outcome the same as most reported cases in the Department of Health. Uh, based on the review of the interventions, no interventions are significantly associated with the survival in comparison to those who did not survive, though trend favor those who receive ocilizumab and most of these investigational drugs. We utilize chest radiograph and chest CT not only to diagnose but also to prognosticate and at the same time use them to assess response to treatment. Now, this is the most important challenge, the presence of co-infections. We have presented here patients with TB, patients with HIV, that uh, among them, if they have COVID-19, risk of mortality, risk of poor, uh, poor outcome has been demonstrated among our patients, especially for those patients who have active tuberculosis and active HIV. So the bottom line here is to always uh, see to it that when these patients have uh, ongoing treatment, they should not discontinue the treatment. They should have a close follow-up with the different uh, uh, Department of Health programs that they will be given the medication, especially for those patients with uh, HIV. And the same protection, the same precautionary measures, we always have to uh, implement among these patients as that with the general population. And lastly, healthcare workers is a highly vulnerable population. Thus, measures to monitor them by regular testing is uh, uh, imperative. Thank you very much for your uh, kind attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Jean. Marami na naman po tayong natutunan uh, from the San Lazaro experience. And 
it was really uh, an eye opener po no on how you have been uh, in, uh, addressing po uh, all of these uh, issues and concerns regarding COVID-19. Just to share that we are now at 195 Zoom webinar participants and I'm pretty sure marami pa rin pong uh, uma-attend, pumapasok at nakikinood po through TVUP and also through our uh, YouTube uh, streaming po. And to share po, uh, we have uh, attendees who have been uh, joining us from uh, as far as Bukidnon Provincial Medical Center in uh, Malaybalay City, Northern Mindanao. We have one from the Caraga Tuberculosis Reference Laboratory in Butuan City in Agusan del Norte. We have the Northern Samar Provincial Hospital in Katarman, Northern Samar, Eastern Visayas. Apayao Cagayan Medical Center from Abulo, Cagayan Valley. Ilocos Sur Provincial Health Office from Vigan, Ilocos Region. Uh, from RITM, obviously po, and from other countries, international na po kayo, Dr. Solante, uh, <laughs> from Singapore, from Mashida, Japan, and from North York in Canada. So yun po ang ating uh, demographics for today. And right now, being flashed on the screen is our uh, post-presentation questions po. It's uh, traditional po, no? uh, just to be able to uh, give a rapid assessment of how our presenter did and I'm pretty sure marami po it. Uh, Dr. Solante, Dr. Jim gets high marks po for this presentation uh, as uh, as evidence po. Uh, so 90% uh, of uh, our attendees uh, strongly agree that uh, the presenter demonstrated thorough knowledge of the webinar topic as well as he was well prepared and organize. Uh, the presenter was also uh, speaking clearly and audibly during the presentation. Uh, the presenter also used appropriate language with technical medical jargons uh, and also used appropriate uh, webinar techniques. So uh, I think this is the time wherein we ask the questions uh, to Dr. Solante. Maybe I could start ahead with the, with the first question. So for our first question, po, Dr. Jin, uh, it is related to the, to the risk factors associated to, to higher mortality in COVID-19. Uh, would you know kung meron pong anything that you could cite as a definitive or maybe slightly uh, correlated for the risk factors? Po? Yeah, so if uh, most of the, if, you, if I'm going to look at our patients here, I think uh, one of that is the age. Those patients uh, whose age is uh, like 60 or 70 and above, regardless of whether they have comorbidities, but most of them also have comorbidities, higher risk factor. But I'm looking also now that HIV and TB can be an important risk factors uh, among this uh, group of patients. Uh, what we've seen in most of our patients, although these are still small number of patients, but uh, if they have low CD4 count, high viral load, or if they are still in the ongoing treatment of tuberculosis and has not yet been in the uh, finish the, the, the treatment, higher risk also for uh, mortality among this uh, group. We haven't seen any cases like dengue with COVID or the other uh, infections, no? but uh, so to say, these are some of the, the, the TB and the HIV are really, uh, for me, I think are important risk factors for morbidity or mortality. Okay, uh, 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 see on your end. Raymond, I wanted to say something, Muna. Uh, first, uh, Jean, thank you so much for your presentation. Very, very informative. I mean, for me personally, I really enjoyed seeing all the, the x-ray slides and the CT scans because uh, this also helps our audience who are in practice uh, get a sense of the cases and uh, how you're using the drugs and all of that. So very, very important, uh, very, very informative, Jean. I think for me, um, before we go into the other questions, given the number of people who have tuberculosis in the country. Um, I think this is very helpful also for PhilHealth that you're saying that we really need to continue treatment for TB dots and VOTs. I thought that was very cute having video, you know, <laughs> video of <laughs> the drugs. But this is the new normal, no? So I was just going to say, Gene, I mean, we call it a risk, but Maybe, I don't know, somewhere in the guidelines when we're looking now at um, diagnosing patients with COVID, we really need to screen and consider tuberculosis in HIV. And, and um, 
I, I'm very happy to hear your presentation because it just gives you all the evidence to say that, look, we're not just looking for hypertension and asthma here. There's so many people who have tuberculosis and possibly HIV, and we may miss that in, in the history. So um, can you just talk a little bit more about uh, how, the, how the doctors need to, I mean, apart from asking the history, because especially for TB, no? Um, as you mentioned, one of your cases, they were on TB meds, they, they're off it. We know that that's the problem. They're on it, then they're off it, then they're on it again, and then they're off it, and then they're resistant. So how do we approach in, in general practice, in primary facilities, in districts, how will we now approach understanding that TB comorbidity, I think it's more than risk, I think it's a comorbidity because it is really an illness. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Asusi, no? and that's a very important uh, question. Now, in most of the experience, in, 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 in especially for the for San Lazaro experience, uh, one, there, it's difficult to diagnose a patient with TB and at the same time with COVID because they can also present with the same clinical manifestation. The important part here is that uh, the exposure. Okay. Now, second. If you, there are what we call, uh, if they come from uh, an area where there is also history of exposure to tuberculosis, and I think that will be the same as that in, when you investigate a patient with uh, a tuberculosis. Most important, do you have patient at home that was diagnosed with tuberculosis, or do you have patient at home diagnosed with or previously treated with tuberculosis? Okay. Second is the physical examination, particularly with HIV. Okay. When you look at some of those patients with a, uh, newly diagnosed with HIV, they already have what we call uh, cachexia, they have muscle wasting, and in fact, most of these patients have what we call the uh, skin eruption, the popular pruritic uh, eruption. The third most important part here is the sexual history. Don't be afraid of asking the sexual history. Even if it's a COVID-19, probably it's, it's really out of the, uh, what we call the, the the usual questions that we ask from our patients with COVID-19, but sexual history is very important. If you want to rule out HIV in a patient with concomitant COVID-19, if you have a patient with multiple partners, you have to do the test also while they are in, in your facility. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Gina. Very, very helpful. And I think as we progress, we'll begin to, uh, to ask more questions along these lines. No, because you know, the, the question about exposure, even on COVID, sa dami kasi ng mga tinetes, sa dami nagpapatingin, wala na eh, no? So, at the end of the day, it's going to boil down again to clinical history and the physical examination. So, you know, all this talk about the testing, I think we still go back to very basic clinical skills in history taking and having that clinical eye and trying to think about is there exposure or not exposure. Jean, there are some questions here. No? Let me read uh, one of them and then the others I think Raymond will want to do. Uh, okay, dami ng question. How many days po ang interval to do a swab test? So when you have patients confined in San Lazaro and they are COVID positive, how often do you do a PCR on them? Okay, so in, during the first uh, few months of the the, the pandemic, okay, we always, because it, it, it is what the DOH uh, 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 recommended, do it every 48 hours until the time the patient is asymptomatic, okay. We changed that since there was a, a, a decrease in the uh, number of the testing kits. So we changed it and also in accordance with the DOH recommendation, we only repeat the test once the patient has absence of symptoms for three days, okay. So okay. if the patient is asymptomatic for more than 72 hours, then we do repeat the, the uh, RT-PCR test. Okay, thank you very much. Raymond, do you have questions? So, or... Yes, other questions for uh, Dr. Solante. Maybe we could uh, get something. I don't know if it's easy or controversial po. Kung baga, no? uh, uh, ang tanong po kasi is, uh, since there is still high community transmission, uh, would you recommend or is it advisable to reopen outpatient clinics? Uy, magandang question yun, Raymond, ah. That's not controversial. Yeah, no, no. Very good question. Ah, yeah, oh, oh. Sige, Gene, what are you doing for OPD? Yeah. Okay, so, 
Hindi siya controversial, difficult question kasi di, di ba, uh, we promote that social, social distancing should also be observed, no? But uh -huh. I think the, the point here is that once we, once we go down to the, okay, I'll give you an example. We are, our HIV clinic is still open until now. And mm -hmm. in fact, we did not have any holiday in terms of the procurement of the medications because th we have a lot of these cases. So uh, they still go here like every Tuesday, Thursday. But the, the, the point here is that you have to schedule. You have to schedule your patients that they should be, not be in one uh, day only. No? So there, there should be appointment with the uh, HIV treatment hub manager. Same as that also with a uh, with, uh, TB program. Okay? So you have to have that schedule. And then for new cases, okay, uh, there is also a day allotted for the new cases compared to those who are, who is going to be on follow-up uh, uh, patients. Okay, so I think I'll, I'll give a breather po muna kay Dr. Solante and maybe I could ask our opening remarks speaker, my boss, Dr. De La Paz, Ma'am Eva. Ma'am, there's a question po here. Uh, uh, there are uh, those who are interested po dun sa training po na binanggit nyo po ma'am kanina. How do they how do they enroll po ba? How do they, how do they register? Thank you so much for that question po. Uh, right now, I closely coordinate uh, this training program with RITM and the Department of Health. Yun pong sa biosafety training which is an online course. Uh, they just have to email uh, the National Training Center for Biosafety and Biosecurity. I can provide that email if they uh, are already in the stages of building a lab so that their laboratory personnel can have the proper biosafety training. Uh, Doon naman po sa hands-on training, which uh, is uh, done in coordination with UP Diliman uh, NIMBB, yung molec MBB, Molecular Biology and Biotechnology, ito po ay closely coordinated ko with RITM. And the reason for that are, is uh, many institutions uh, need training, but we have to prioritize yung mga uh, laboratories that are already in the stage four, stage five of, uh, of building a lab. Uh, they're given priority so that they can be given the hands-on training. Kasi after that po, they can already ask for the proficiency panel as long as they've also uh, completed all the, the, all the requirements of RITM to accredit their lab, uh, bibigyan na po sila ng proficiency panel testing. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Eva. Ma'am, to recap lang po, no? the NTCBB training is online. Tama po ba, ma'am? That's correct. That is okay. online. And I think there's another one na hands-on naman po. That's correct. So you cannot move on to the hands-on without the uh, biosafety training because it's uh, vital that people know how to protect themselves from the vi from the from this infectious agent if they are laboratorians. Okay, thank you, Dr. Eva. So, so, so to the one who asked the question, po, no, uh, it's very important po that you are able to complete the online training by the National Training Center for Biosafety and Biosecurity before moving on to the actual hands-on in-person na training po. Thank you, Dr. Eva. For Dr. Sulante, there's a question po um, with regards to the increased mortality among patients with COVID-19 and concomitant infections. Uh, what is the current stance po uh, for patients undergoing immunosuppressive uh, therapy such as those that uh, need corticosteroid therapy or uh, kailangan po ng trans nag nag transplant po? Yun po, sir. Okay, uh... It's a very good question because uh, there are also part, con part contraindications to these uh, uh, investigational drugs if you are immunocompromised no? or if you are immunosuppressed. And if you have a patient with concomitant malignancy, just an example, patients with HIV with a CD4 count of less than 200, giving your tocilizumab, giving your anti-inflammatory drugs, we're so careful with that because we don't know, no? for example, some of these patients, the, the, the patients that with HIV and TB, we were so, it was so tempting to give them the anti-inflammatory drugs, but they have HIV, they have TB. 
obviously we can't give them because that can only aggravate the con the ongoing infection and that's i think one of the area here that if they will be in cytokine storm because of covid-19 with a concomitant tb and hiv then that will be put be put them at higher risk of mortality okay right, thank you very much ah uh, teka muna meron ako nakita dito Raymond kasi uh doc Gene was already talking about inflammation there was a, a question here around blood clotting and and strokes, no? I'm looking for it. Um, anyway, uh, for those who are asking, no, we have, uh, we, we're going to send the PowerPoint to you on, on YouTube, sorry, on, on email, and then you can go to TVUP on YouTube to watch, watch it again or to use this for your own training. Okay, so here's the question, Gene. There have been reports in the U.S. of blood clotting leading to stroke and embolism in COVID patients. Are we seeing this in our patients as well? And what do you suggest as clinical interventions? That's from uh, Lester. Okay, so, uh, thank you for that uh, uh, question, Lester. No? Uh, in our experience, uh, we, uh, we haven't seen those uh, cases with the throm throm thrombotic-related or thrombosis-related uh, complications. But just the same, when we have patients like elderly, with comorbidities like hypertension. These are also the patients higher risk of developing uh, thrombosis-related complications. That's why uh, part of the team in the management of this uh, severe critical COVID, we always have the cardiologist, the interventional or the intensive care uh, physician part of the team because uh, this is already outside of the realm of infectious diseases, maybe for pulmonologists, but uh, it entails multidisciplinary uh, uh, subspecialty management to really address all these issues. Okay, Gene, there's another one here, no? and I know you wanted to talk about this. I think this is the moment. Pedro is asking, doctor, based on your patients, were they with flu and or pneumococcal vaccination and was there some kind of protection provided? So I know you wanted to talk a little bit more about adult vaccination. So in the patients that you've seen, uh, did we know whether or not they had flu vaccination or pneumococcal uh, vaccination. Yeah, so the patients that had uh, <clears throat> co-infection with influenza B and Streptococcus doesn't even does not, did not receive any uh, of those vaccines. Okay? And that's why I think the importance here of giving the vaccination. Okay, let's just have to point this out. The, the, the vaccine for, for this is for influenza and Streptococcus pneumoniae, and it's not for COVID-19. Why are we recommending the use of this vaccine? Why? Because if you had these patients, HIV, TB, elderly, they're at high risk also of developing influenza and pneumococcal complication. What if they had this infection and at the same time, you also have a COVID-19 infection? Then that again increases the risk of mortality because we did not give the opportunity to, for these patients to be given the vaccine. So, so to say that they should have been protected with the vaccine and less of the complications of the superimposed or secondary bacterial infection. Okay, thank you for that answer, uh, Dr. Jean. Uh, there's another practical, shall we say, question po, no, sir? Uh, in, based on San Lazaro experience po, sir, do you do like a, a dual ba, bi-directional screening for COVID-19 and tuberculosis? Uh, Yes, we do that. No? Initially, during the first uh, the two months, the second month, when we had one nurse, okay, when we have one healthcare worker who turned out to be positive in the TB unit. Okay? So the, the infection control committee decided to do screening for all patients with admitted because of TB, screen them for, for COVID-19. Okay? And uh, fortunately, uh, I think only... Only one patient turned out to be positive, and uh, uh, the clinical manifestation was really more on TB, and it's not much of the COVID-19. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then, I think marami po sa ating mga attendees po no? uh, represent the pharmacy sector po. And then there are clamors po for uh, future webinar, proposed webinar topics po in the future. But for now, I think an uh, important question po sa kanila, Dr. Jean, would be are there any significant drug-drug interactions regarding uh, any of the proposed uh, therapies for COVID-19 with anti-tuberculosis medication naman po? 
Yes, there is, no? So we, your lupinavir, ritonavir, okay, will have a very high rate of drug-drug interaction with your... Uh, uh, I'm, I'm talking about the, the patients with TB. So like, if you, have, if you have a patient with tuberculosis, uh, we have to have a COVID-19 patient with tuberculosis, okay? Are you going to give the lupinavir, ritonavir, which is one of the investigational drugs? I should not be giving that because that will also decrease the concentration of your rifampicin, which is important okay. in this patient. Okay. Thank you. Uh, other questions from your end, Dr. Susi? Raymond, hey, there's a related question here about the use of chloroquine and hydrochloroquine. I mean, if we use it for patients with COVID, is there a possibility that uh, you have CQ resistance in relation to malaria? This is a question from Alhora. Uh, in fact, our chloroquine resistant malaria is really very high. No? That's why we are not using it anymore. So, so, so to speak, we have eliminated chloroquine in the regimen for malaria, but I just don't know if there is a chloroquine cross resistance with the current anti malaria, anti -malaria drugs. Okay. So, Raymond, I think in the future, this thing about drug interaction, as has been mentioned by one of the, one of the participants, is something we need to talk about because we've heard this also in previous webinars. No? When, you know, we're trying to give uh, the medications that are available. On the other hand, when you have high comorbidities and you're giving all kinds of other medicines. So uh, this is uh, sort of an important continuing, continuing discussion for us. There's another question here which I think is um, interesting. Uh, there was a question here about um, those who, if they test negative, so you said, Dr. Jean, that they, uh, you test every 72 hours, no, every three days. And if they test negative, how many times do you have to get a negative PCR? And do you have patients who actually test, uh, continue to test positive and become asymptomatic? Or are yes. they yeah, okay, so questions together, yeah. Okay, so uh, in, in our protocol uh, here, uh, we do the criteria for discharge is one, the patient should be asymptomatic. Second, the patient should be RT PCR negative twice. Okay. Twice, okay. Yes, twice. Now we have experience, uh, in fact, you go to 20 to 30 percent of our patients, they have RT PCR negative, and then they have. RT-PCR positive again, and they're already asymptomatic. Right. So the question then, are you going to discharge them since they also they are fully as asymptomatic and one is negative and only the latest one is positive? No? So again, it depends on you. But again, our, our consensus then is we have to develop, uh, we have to get a two negative. So we don't discharge them as long as they have an RT-PCR positive. They should have a negative RT-PCR before we can discharge them. We have Jean, another page. Yes, yes. Jean, would there be any, any room for using an antibody test? I mean, not necessarily the, the rapid test kit, but uh, there are, I, I've heard already about some antibody tests that are being used using Architect, for example, where uh, they take two ml of blood. It's the same test that they use for, for HIV, for blood screening, and for hepatitis C. So is there any potential? Because the thing about the RT-PCR is that it, it can also pick up virus fragments that are dead, right? Yes, so yes, right. how about antibody? What do you think of that? Yes, very good question. Because right now, we, we are now uh, submitting our proposal for an antibody testing parallel with RT-PCR among our patients here in San Lazaro Hospital. And uh, we, we now, uh, we do serum banking. So we, we keep right. the serum of those uh, patients. Yes. Uh, the, the initial diagnosis when they are RT-PCR positive until they were negative. So we keep those. And hopefully once this antibody test, not necessarily the rapid antibody test, but the, the, true, the true antibody test that uh, higher sensitivity and higher specificity, hopefully we can also utilize that and test the, the, the utility of this antibody test among our patients with, with uh, COVID-19 and has recovered. Okay, thank you very much. Raymond, and dami pang question dito. Let's take a few more, maybe two more. Doc, and daming question. I'm telling you, it's been a very fascinating discussion. Raymond, go ahead. You choose. So for uh, Dr. Solante po ulit, no? Sir, um, any, anything that you could share in terms of the use of uh, convalescent plasma therapy uh, uh, that uh, from the San Lazaro experience po? 
Uh, so my my answer to that, we haven't we don't have any patient yet uh, given the convalescent plasma. Okay, sir. Okay. Uh, other questions, naman po is um, related naman po dun sa um, patients who uh, are suspect COVID and suspect TB. Is there parang is there po ba a timing in terms of uh, that? Test that you will need to conduct. Uh, what will be the protocol? Ganun po, sir. Okay, so the current protocol now is: if you have patient COVID-19 suspect, and you also suspect that this patient is TB, we do first the COVID-19 RT-PCR, and then after that, we do also the uh, gene expert uh, TB. So we prioritize first the COVID-19 before we do the uh, gene expert for TB. Thank you, sir. Thank you for that explanation, Dr. Susi. Okay, so I think we'll take just a few more, uh, a few more questions here. Um, trying to look at something. Okay, precautions for HIV/AIDS patients would be the would they be the same for for COVID? Uh, yes, in terms of the prevention, as I mentioned, I think we have mentioned that one already in terms of social distancing, the hand washing, and the wearing of face masks. We have a, 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 an HIV ward uh, just above the, the COVID unit ward. No? So the people there are not allowed to go down and be in the COVID unit. So we always, we always uh, make sure that there will be uh, the traffic of the visitors will be very different with the COVID unit and that of the tuberculosis. Okay, another question. Well, this is more, Doc, this is more of a systems question, but it's good to get your opinion on it. So they're asking if the diagnostic capability for co-infections uh, is, okay, so the question is from Ryan, does the current COVID-19 testing affect the laboratory capacity in the country? I mean, I know there's a lot of, um, there are many issues around this. On the one hand, we want to build laboratory capability like, uh, and, and do more testing for COVID, and the gene expert machine is one of the machines that we want to use. And then at the same time, we still don't have enough gene expert machines for tuberculosis either. So how do we just, I know it's a systems question, it's not about clinical management, but what are your thoughts on improving uh, diagnostic capability for infections in the country? Coming from San Lazaro, seeing what you're seeing and knowing what it's like on the ground in the field, what does the country need to do to improve our capability for diagnostics on infections? Okay, so tough question, but uh, I, I'll have to base it on what I have seen and what I have experienced. One is you have to have manpower. You have to have enough people who really can do those tests, okay? Because if you have all those machines, if you have all those gene experts, but the question then is, I only have three, four med techs in my, in my laboratory. How can I develop this system? How can I develop a very good uh, laboratory capability given those, given those uh, limitations? So you have to have one manpower. Second, you have to have a very good leader in your hospital that can really create the harmonious, uh, what we call, uh, uh, capability, open to collaboration, open to networking, open to training. Because it's only what, that's the only way we can also expand our capability in terms of expansion to other diagnostic tests. And number three, you should have a very good support from the Department of Health. Okay, thank you very much, Gene. Uh, I think... Uh, on that note, uh, we're going to ask uh, Dr. Eva to respond to that and maybe to just give her insights on on the lecture and what do you think uh, what do you think was discussed that has some research leads for everyone that we could we could probably pursue. Eva, over to you. Thank you, Dr. Susie. I think uh, what we have seen is uh, the richness of experience that San Lazaro has. Uh, I mean, this is like over the years, not only during this COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Uh, and uh, right now, uh, what Dr. Solante has given us is, uh, is uh, many, uh, also the, the richness of his experience dealing with COVID-19 cases in the last, uh, I would say, three months since the start because they actually took care of the first patient 
uh, who was uh, identified in the first ever case identified in the Philippines. So uh, we appreciate the way that he has uh, given us a very good uh, and comprehensive uh, uh, explanation or discussion of the, their management strategies from diagnosis to clinical presentation. And, and as you said, Dr. Mercado, he uh, also enlightened, uh, gave us a, a good, um, uh, a good illustrations on CT scans, X-rays that probably uh, will help many of our colleagues in different parts of the Philippines uh, to uh, help them in their management of uh, cases. And more importantly, I think because HIV, TB. They're here to stay. Did I get it right, Dr. Salante? These are not going to go away. And so uh, being able to recognize that um, the emerging infection, that we the uh, emerging viruses, uh, while we battle those emerging viruses, this uh, other conditions that have been uh, scar uh, you know, um, plaguing our country uh, are also are also important to uh, recognize that they are uh, part of us and uh, that their management should also be given due uh, importance. Um, and I think uh, he he did mention that they're going to start studies on antibodies. I think many of the institutions who deal with uh, cases of COVID the COVID referral hospitals, as well as the research institutions like San Lazaro, RITM, and the Philippine General Hospital. Uh, right now, everyone's cooperating to come up with uh, researches that will help us uh, improve uh, our diagnostic capability, as well as uh, our therapeutic management. So uh, the solidarity trial uh, for sure is going to make a a big impact in management in the next uh, months to come. Um, and uh, I think, uh, Dr. Susie, I think we also need to think about doing research on how the government measures to like do the ECQ, how has it affected, what has its, what has its impact been in society, not only health, but also affecting our socioeconomic um, um, uh, st uh, status, as well as the psychological uh, impact of uh, the measures that the government has undertaken to, uh, to fight COVID-19. Um, many different sectors of society, not only the health care providers, as well as health researchers, can actually embark in studies to answer the many questions that we have for, for uh, for our present pandemic. I think a, the, a better understanding of uh, what we are dealing with, uh, the, our unknown enemy, uh, will actually help us move things forward. Yun lang po. Um, Raymond, you want to go to the answers to the, no? To the, yes. To, so that we can ask Dr. Solante what the, what the, what the correct answer is. Ako, baka bagsak Apa. tayo. Uh, well, well, first and foremost, thank you so much to NIH Executive Director Dr. Eva for uh, for that uh, closing remarks, and we appreciate uh, all the insights that you shared with us uh, based on the presentation by Dr. Solante. And then for Dr. Jean, sir, first yes. question: Simultaneous <laughs> testing for both PTB and COVID-19 will be indicated for three main reasons, except. Yeah. Ano the, so, I think for me, it's the previous history of BCG vaccine and pulmonary calcification. Yay! Which has been answered by 63% of our attendees. Oh, pasado and then, ka, Raymond. Pasado ka dyan. <laughs> Opo. <laughs> and then for sec second question po is, ano? Um, <laughs> and then for the second question po, the following are the precautionary measures that people living with HIV should adhere to prevent the spread of COVID-19 infection, except? Yeah, I had the alcohol gel. Why al alcohol gel? <laughs> okay po. Hindi kasi sir, para po ano, malinaw din po. <laughs> oh. uh, yun po, uh, which has been answered by 68% of our attendees. Uh, oh, anything? How salt and water? Oh, yes po. Oh, yes. Po. Gel. So, it's the soap and water. 
So I think we have to go back to the very, very basic public health uh, measures. No? Just wash your hands frequently with soap and water. So I, I'm, I'm very happy for that question, Dr. Jean. Maganda yun. <laughs> trick, trick question. <laughs> Okay po. So, uh, any last questions for Dr. Susie, for Dr. Jean, or for Dr. Eva? Uh, no, I don't have any questions. I want to thank our guests. I want to thank uh, Eva for your time and for all the things you've been doing for the country, and Jean as well. My goodness, I can't imagine what it's like to be working in San Lazaro at a time like this, but here you are. You were able to get all the cases together and show them. But I know, Jean, you should know that there are people watching from all over the country. And this, uh, this webinar gets replayed on YouTube through TVUP and the University of the Philippines has been amazing at getting all of this together in a way that is interesting for everyone. And so we just want to uh, want to thank you both for your time. Now, next week, uh, we're going to have very interesting speaker. We're going to have Dr. Antonio Ramos, Tony Ramos from the Philippine Lung Center. And he's going to talk about protecting health workers from, uh, from infections. Uh, again, another warrior at the front line who will have many, many interesting insights to share with you on what they're doing in the lung center so that nobody gets infected. I think that's a very top of mind concern for all of you who are on the webinar. But on behalf of, on behalf of um, the whole team that's worked together, I would like to thank Dr. Jean, Eva, thank you so much for all that you're doing for us. On, and on behalf of the Philippine Health Insurance Corporation that is now in the new normal, trying to reach out to everybody, share information, improve the quality of care, and just work in partnerships. I'd just like to thank all of our participants on the webinar and all of you who are watching on the playback. Over to you, Raymond. Thank you so much, Dr. Susie. And with that, we conclude our fifth installment of the University of Philippines and Philippine Health Insurance Corporation's uh, webinar series uh, on Stop COVID Deaths. Uh, magsama-sama po tayo ulit for our next webinar, which uh, has been already described by Dr. Susie. And we will have a resource speaker from the Lung Center of the Philippines, which is a COVID-19 referral hospital for, for everyone. I, I think everyone knows that already. Uh, to di to up to this time, we all, we still have 160 plus attendees uh, with us. So, marami salamat, and that is how engaging uh, the presentation of Dr. Solante has been, and also the questions and the answers uh, given by uh, Dr. Eva and Dr. Jean uh, to the questions that were posed. So, maraming salamat po, and uh, makita kita po tayo let like I mentioned. Uh, keep safe, keep healthy, and see you online. Thank you. Thank you.